a teenager, all my friends told me I was a church nerd. I guess I was. I went to my first general assembly of the disciples denomination when I was 17. I never missed church camp in the summer or other regional youth events throughout the year. I would go hang out at both my church and at the regional office just because I thought it was a fun way to spend the afternoon. I also got appointed by the church board chair to be the youth representative to the board. I felt very self-important as I was allowed to witness and be a part of debates over the color to paint the per church parlor and other such weighty things although I then would wonder whether nerdiness had slipped over into masochism. <laughs> now, of course, it's easy to make fun of such things, but the truth is that the church board didn't only deal with such small items. No, on occasion they dealt with some really, really important things. And sometimes those things could be pretty contentious. It was, after all, the mid-60s. 
and a turbulent time in American life, and that turbulence and the issues facing society made their way into the church too, thank goodness. There was one particular member of the board, let's call him Joe, who often found himself, in fact almost always found himself, on the losing side of votes. Joe's point of view was often very just different. And during the board's deliberations, he would argue mightily for his point of view. But finally, the vote would be taken. And as I say, Joe would more often than not find himself on the losing side. But this is where he taught me so very, very much a lesson that has stayed with me to this day. After the results were announced, Joe's hand would immediately go up and he would make a motion that the, that the vote now be made unanimous in favor of the side that had won. In other words, in the interests of unity, after he lost a vote, he changed his vote to support the winning side, and he invited by his motion the others who had voted with him to change their votes as well so that the board could emerge from that meeting speaking with one voice, speaking in unity. This was a lesson in what we used to call churchmanship that I have never forgotten. It's something you don't see very often today. I suppose there are many reasons for that. In the last 40 years, our society has gotten more angry, I think, and less willing to compromise. In fact, compromise in the 19th and early 20th centuries was thought of as a very commendable virtue. Nowadays, though, under the influence of too many special interest groups, whether from the right or the left, it seems to be mostly the case that the word compromise is now a dirty word. There are many groups who will tell you that any compromise whatsoever with whatever their positions are is not a virtue but a moral failure. Our 24-hour internet-driven, 300-cable TV channel, conspiracy theory-loving society has made gestures like Joe's seem quaint or weird or wrong-headed and certainly not something to be lauded or held up as an example to emulate. These are some of the things that I have been thinking about this week as I considered our scripture for today, the Gospel of John's portrayal of Jesus' last prayer with his disciples as he shares his hopes, instructions, and expectations for them. And at the center of that long prayer, of which we have an excerpt today, is a line that Jesus says twice, so that they may all be one. This prayer, so that they may all be one, has animated church folks down through the ages. It was the guiding hope of some of the founders of our own movement. As one of them said, Christian unity is our polar star. Our sister denomination, the United Church of Christ, was formed in the late 50s with similar hopes. And in fact, its very logo includes the phrase, so that they may all be one. This morning, then, I want to take a few minutes and think about this notion of unity and ask what we might be able to learn about Christian unity from this prayer of Jesus's. What might Jesus mean and not mean by the idea of being one, by the idea of unity? Well, let me suggest three things that this idea of unity means and does not mean. 
First, unity does not mean uniformity. Whenever churches, or for that matter, families or friends or couples or any organization make that mistake, then they are inevitably less than they could be. One of the issues that sometimes comes up or should come up in premarital counseling, for example, is to what extent the couple should enjoy doing the very same things. But the mistake that some couples make is to think that their tastes and desires must be absolutely uniform and united in every way. That though only leads to resentment and frustration. Barbara and I learned early in our marriage that we both loved to travel and that our travel tastes in many ways were indeed the same and some of our best memories are of shared travels. But we also discovered we had some differences. For example, I love the southwestern desert. I love driving through it for hours at a time. I love its awesome splendor that goes on forever. But as the phrase goes in our family, that is not her favorite. She, on the other hand, loves to visit gardens and admire the variety of horticulture and preen over every possible bud and bloom. Oh, I think I'm being a little biased here. (laughs) Things that somewhere that's not the desert provides. I get bored silly with that. Luckily, we realized early on that we didn't need to be completely uniform in these tastes to nonetheless have a deep unity to our lives together. And in fact, we were a whole lot more interesting to each other when we each took some time to do the particular things we each loved with other folks. It can be similar with churches, too. A church that is growing lively and thriving will not stake its unity on any sort of uniformity. A church that is growing lively and thriving will have a variety of activities, and some of those will be of no interest to some folks. A church that is growing lively and thriving, will have a variety of worship and music styles, knowing that some of them will speak deeply to some, but not to others. And a church that is growing lively and thriving will not simply tolerate these differences, but will celebrate them. The alternative, uniformity, is so much grimmer because when there is the expectation that a church's unity lies in a uniformity of belief or practice or style then what you often end up with is a kind of lowest common denominator life where the only things that happen are the things that everybody can absolutely agree on but whether in church or relationship or marriage or family, such an attitude leads not to liveliness, but to boredom. And the last thing the church should ever be is boring. So that they may all be one. Let's notice a second thing about this prayer. Sometimes Christians have explicitly or unintentionally defined what all means in much too small a fashion. You can see this throughout Christian history. In certain quarters these days, it is said that if you want to start a new church, you should target that church to people who are pretty much exactly alike with similar economic means and politics and ethnicity. But churches that do that sort of targeting end up making the all far too small. 
and they inadvertently end up sending the message to those around them, to their community, that all actually only means some, and the right kind of some at that. It's as if these folks have retranslated Jesus' prayer into that some of them may be one. Or much more odiously were those in our own history who said that slaves were not in fact human beings and that therefore Jesus' words about unity, about oneness, did not mean that they were included President Warren Harding once said that God only in fact listens to prayers that are spoken in English and does not listen to those said at all by Jewish people. As a child, I went several summers to a family friend's church for vacation Bible school, and I remember two things mainly about vacation Bible school at that church. First was the grape knee-high we got at break. Uh, each, each day, but the second was the matter-of-fact way that all the teachers and leaders in that church talked to all of us children who weren't in that church in a matter-of-fact, factual way about, sorry, but you all are all going to hell for eternity. Six-year-olds. There have been and continue to be churches that achieve their unity by making sure that gay and lesbian folks are not welcome unless they renounce the way that God made them. Unity is much easier when it is confused with exclusivity. But that's hardly the kind of unity that Jesus meant, I think. And let us then notice a third and final thing about Jesus' prayer. The unity that Jesus prayed for was not simply for its own sake. It was not simply so that all of us would feel good about each other coming here to have a kind of spiritual spa together. No. Jesus prayed that they all might be one for the sake of the mission of the church. How so? Well, look at who Jesus, whom Jesus is praying for. He's praying for the world. He's praying for those who do not yet know the gospel, but will come to know it because the disciples and those who come after them will demonstrate such a love of such a gracious God that those who don't know God will be convinced. Who are those who come after them? That's you and me. Jesus' prayer is for us to be faithful to God's true character and never get sidetracked. God's character is love, amazing, unbounded, perfect. If we insist on uniformity or exclusivity, we will not reflect God's unbounded love and our witness will be less than convincing. We will tacitly tell the world that some people aren't really welcome. Put another way, Jesus is praying that his disciples and we will continue the work he began to make the God of all known to show with our lives and our attitudes just how much God loves the world. Let me sum all of this up in this way. Jesus' Jesus's prayer is that we never be more imperfect than we needed to be. Jesus' prayer is the hope that amidst even deep disagreement that we might have over important theological points that we will never write anyone off, never make the all smaller than God intends it to be. Why? So that the world can indeed come to know a grace-filled, gracious, loving, including God who bears healing and hope to all 
and excludes no one. We indeed are Jesus' latter-day disciples called to demonstrate that we exist not just to feel good about ourselves and enjoy our community with one another, but for all of those who don't know the God that we know. And we'll demonstrate that to a needy and hurting world so much better when that mission is so much more important to each one of us than the differences that any of us may have. It will sometimes seem like a lot to ask, but it's not really. Because God goes with us, God helps us. God keeps on working for the day when indeed all, really all, all shall be one. God won't give up because like my long ago fellow church member Joe, God also intends to make the outcome unanimous.